Well, I, it's pretty safe to say that it all started with uh, Morris Stubbs, um, who, who I met in the 1970s, late 1970s. I was a financial analyst in the Department of Finance at the time, and um, he was director of the Macintosh Gallery, and so I, <clears throat> he was one of my assignments. So I got to know him through that, visited him regularly, especially at budget time. So on one occasion, and this came as quite a surprise to me, he said, well, why don't you and your wife come to the Macintosh Gallery? There's an opening coming up Friday, it was Thursday or Friday, and it was a Rudolph Bicker show of his prints. And Morris hadn't met Flora at that point, knew me pretty well over the years. And um, so I said, okay, sure, didn't think much about that. So we went. And as it turned out, and uh, Morris, at least Flora and I teased Morris so much about this that, that he actually rigged it, but we won the door prize, and it was a Rudolph Bickers print. But with respect to the print, Rudolph Bickers that evening invited Flora and I over to visit his studio, and um, we saw a piece there. It was an egg tempera on board called um, Without Sight. We bought the egg tempera on board. It's now in the Macintosh. And um, the moment we did that, he said, I think um, you might like the other four prints in the set of the suite of five. And so we did. We, we happily accepted that. And that was the beginning of our art collection. Well, the most important thing about collecting for us was to really like the work to begin with. And that was the primary criteria in terms of acquiring a piece. And um, there's absolutely no consideration at all about the investment value, the future investment value of that piece. So it was strictly, we had to like it. Flora and I had to agree on whether or not that would be the piece we, we would take home. There was actually, there was one point, one case where we didn't communicate very effectively and we didn't agree. And um, but occasionally we would cheat on that rule of uh, buying just one piece um, at an art opening. And um, in fact, we'd get around it by um, giving each other gifts at Christmas and Valentine's. So kind of sneaky. It didn't happen too often, but it was kind of, kind of nice when we did it. We also um, wanted to be sure that we got to know the artist as best we could and as soon as we could. And so we were often invited ourselves to studios and we certainly tried to catch the artist at, artist at the openings that artists would have. So we made a practice of that so we get to, get to know the artist. And the really sweet part about collecting is that if you like the work, it's even nicer. It's a bonus to like the artist as well. And um, that turned out to be the, the case many more, much more often than not, actually. Another consideration was the focus of our collection it largely uh, regional artists, artists from the London area. And um, so that was really, it came to be quite important to us to focus on that. And um, as you'll see around you, uh, most of the art is from the London area. A few exceptions to that, a few international pieces. But largely speaking, it's from the area, from this part of our world. And uh, there was another um, consideration, and that's that it, the piece had to fit within our monthly budget and cash flow. We only, um, we only had one salary in the household, and uh, we had two children to raise, and we had a mortgage, and there were summer camps for the, for the kids, so um, it was really important for us to, to maintain a budget for art. As a matter of fact, we would have, um, right next to the food budget, we'd have a budget for art, sort of um, food, for the, food for the body and nourishment for the soul, right? So it's that kind of thing. We just try to manage that as best we could. So it was important to us to, to make sure that the works that we were considering, which is one of the things we had to think about, was that it would fit in with the collection we already had on the walls, and that the wall piece that we were acquiring would be able to speak to the others. And that might seem silly, but it was important. And um, if um, one was a little too strong, it might just find a, a wall of its own, if we could find one. So, so that was another important consideration, because we've basically hang things salon style and uh, found ourselves stacking paintings one one on one right up to the ceiling literally from floor to ceiling and um, so it's it's um, it was a bit of a challenge so we gave a lot of thought to that part of it
Well, actually, we dealt with both art dealers and, and artists directly. Um, at the very beginning, actually, it was with artists primarily, three that I can recall. And um, Rudolf Bickers was one, Morris Stubbs, our dear friend Morris, a friend of 40 years now. We set up an arrangement, sort of like a patronage arrangement, where we, we could afford to pay $50 a month to Morris, and then whenever, and I would have the right of first refusal for any works that he had created. The third artist that we dealt with early on was, um, directly I should say, was uh, Roly Fenwick. Uh, became another dear, dear friend. And I first came across him when he painted with Duncan de Kergamo, and they actually went out painting in the field together in the London area, and um, each would choose a scene and each painted it from their own perspective, with their own taste reflected in it. And that show was um, hosted by the Macintosh Gallery, and I think it was 1981. It's called Take Two. So there was, for each scene, there were the two paintings. And I remember um, the one that caught my eye was Duncan, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Duncan's, it was Roly Fenwick's London Landscape. And Duncan did another London Landscape as well. So I thought, well, and Flora agreed that we should buy the pair. So in this case, we got two paintings, but we both agreed on it, and it made sense to have the two from the Take Two show, of two different views of the same scene. Um, we always had one rule, and that was when we, are, we're, we were talking to artists about making a, an acquisition, we would make sure that we didn't negotiate the fee. Whatever price they had on the, on the work of art, was the price we paid, so we didn't try to negotiate at all. It wasn't a question of what do you need, it's what, what would you like, what would you want for this piece. So that's the way we dealt with, with the artist directly. And with respect to the galleries, um, especially if it was a big ticket item, we would, we would feel free to ask the, the gallery owner or director if we could do time payments. So that was always acceptable. So that was a nice way to do, make acquisitions for the larger pieces and still spread the, the payments out to fit into our budget and cash flow. Actually, there were a number of pieces that got away and came back around again. Um, one of them that I can think of is the Jack Bush um, called Separate Worlds. And in that case, um, it was shown at the um, Jack Bush, Bush retrospective at um, Gibson Gallery and was on the invitation and uh, Mike Gibson put it in a very special place, one that I know he always puts some of his more attractive pieces because the moment you come in the door you see you see it on the wall right in front of you and it, it was this Jack Bush and it was a stunning piece as I say it was on the invitation but it was just at a bad time it was a very expensive piece we um, really couldn't afford it I don't know what the circumstances were at the time, but we had to pass on it, sadly. And um, about five years later, um, this piece surfaced again at another Jack Bush retrospective. And this time it was at um, Mike Gibson's competitor, Jens Thielsen's gallery. There was no invitation in this case, but it was a retrospective of Bush's work. And when, I saw, when we saw the invitation on the internet, it wasn't, um, there was no hard copy invitation, but rather online e email invite. I said to Flora, gosh, we must have been looking at a print. There's, there's separate worlds again. That couldn't have been a watercolor. This is a print we're dealing with. And that really was too expensive. So we checked it out. I went into Thielsen's. It, no, it really was a watercolor on paper. And um, at that time, this was many years later, not many, maybe five. We had, the, the circumstances were different. We had some money, and I think we might have cut a deal with Jens to do time payments on that one. But that's how the Jack Bush Separate Worlds came back around to us. Another one that got away was um, Gil Mall's Triptych, um, Safety in Numbers. Uh, it's hanging in our dining room, or actually resting on a dough box in our d dining room. And it was first, we first saw it uh, this was after we'd committed to a large or major piece of gills that was called Pure Honey. And uh, so we already had one, but 
Pure Honey was invited into a show at the Macintosh. It was a retrospective of Gilmore's works, of his kite series. Pure Honey was one. And there's this lovely triptych of, from his, geis, his geese um, series. And um, saw it hanging, it was actually hanging very close to Pure Honey, our Pure Honey that was in the show as well. But this was not a show on sale. It was basically just a retro, retrospective show. So unfortunately, this lovely triptych of um, safety and numbers with the geese kite floating down on a, a canopy or a, a camouflage with uh, corn niblets on it, corn, corn kernels, was not for sale. And I didn't know who owned it, but it was lovely. It was just a delicious piece. And um, so I thought, boy, wouldn't I like to have that as well? So it would have been nice. But it came up, fortunately, in a show and sale that the Museum London had called London Collects, and they had an auction. And this was probably five years later, six or seven, I'm not sure. But um, this piece came up for auction, and it was the same price that we'd seen on it at the time we saw it first. And uh, so we, we had a chance to commit to that, and we, which we did. Another work that came and went and came back around again was um, Greg Curnow's um, Zenith Thorndale, a watercolor. And uh, it was actually a very early watercolor from 1962. And Flora and I were always looking for a watercolor that had the block printing that Greg was, has become famous for, well known for. But this was a really particularly early piece. And we saw it at um, Gibson, I'm sorry, correction, Thielson's Gallery. And um, we noticed it. We were both there. And um, we were being pretty particular about it because there was this little notch of a tear on the upper left-hand corner. I don't think it even entered into the um, image itself. But we were being pretty particularly picky because it was pricey. Again, um, it was Greg Cuneau and this was later in his career, but a much earlier piece. And so he pointed the tear out to Jens, and he said, oh, yes, I know, it's probably going to bother you. So we passed on that. And, um, oh, it must have been half a decade later, um, we were still looking for a Greg Curnow watercolor that had block printing in it. <clears throat> and this time, Jens still had it, and he brought it out. He said, we, we, have, we still have, we have one. <clears throat> he brought it out. And he said, um, with a, a bit of a smile and a wink, he said, this one doesn't have a tear in it. And of course, the, his, his sister Margaret, who works in re conservation, or restoration rather, and work in the gallery, had repaired the tear. And of course, at this point, we, they were pretty scarce, so we committed to it. And I joked ever since that this is, has to be the most expensive tear repair in history because the price had almost doubled between the time we, we saw it years ago with the little notch and the time now that we've purchased it as <clears throat> being repaired. So anyway, another lesson learned. Another one was um, Ricky Atkinson's uh, Yellow Umber Huron. And um, this one I saw about four times, I think. The first was when Roly Fenwick and I were visiting uh, Ricky for coffee at his home, at Ricky's home. And um, after every occasion when we were over there, he would take us down to the studio in his basement, his ground floor level studio, to show us what he was up to. And uh, in this case, he was preparing for a show. I didn't know exactly what show. As it turned out, there were two shows involved. But um, we went down there, about eight or ten panels, and, and he was actually taking out the bottoms of drawers from antique dressers. So if you're ever looking for an antique dresser in London, check out the bottoms of the drawers, because they might not be there. Ricky, I guess, got the world supply, and he did did up a number of these works on pa these panels. And um, so he had them all lined up in the basement and along the wall. We sort of walked by them, and almost at the same time, both Roly and I said, that's the best one. Well, it happened to be, as it turns out, yellow umber Huron. And uh, that was all that was said at the time. We went back up, said goodbye. And uh, the next time I saw this, this particular piece, we were having um, um, a barbecue at uh, Joseph Hubbard's. And Arlene Kennedy, another good friend of ours, um, Joseph Hubbard, 
um, and Arlene Kennedy, who has a, a gallery called um, Circle Arts up in Tobermory. And she had Yellow Umber Huron on an invitation for her show or for her summer show. And uh, she was handing out the invitations around the table where we were having the cocktails and barbecue at Joseph Hubbard's. So this was the second time I was, I'd seen Yellow Umber Huron, this time on an invitation. It was going to be in a show for the summer at Circle Arts. The third time was um, for a show that um, obviously Ricky was preparing for as well at, in Toronto at his dealer, Moore, the Moore Gallery. And um, uh, we had trundled down, a f bunch of friends. We drove, I drove down, I think it was my car, with Al Stewart, who's um, the dealer at, at uh, Westland Gallery and the Art Exchange in London, Rolly, F Rolly Fenwick and Morris Stubbs. We all bu bundled in the car and went down to see Ricky's show at the Moore Gallery in Toronto. And um, almost every work had been sold at that particular exhibition, except this one piece, yellow, Umber Huron. And I think the reason it wasn't sold is that the frame, for some reason, had been scuffed up really badly, dented and banged up. I don't know who transported it, but it didn't carry very well. I mentioned that to Ricky. I said, Ricky, I really like this piece. This is the third time I'd seen it, right? I said, I, I think I, this is speaking to me. This, this should be in Florinian's collection. But it's got a really bunged up frame. And I'm being kind of particular here, I suppose, but that was the last I said of it, so I didn't commit to it at the time. We get back to London. Months later, um, I guess Arlene was settling up for the business that she had with Ricky for her circle arts, the pieces she took up there to sell. And she wanted one of the pieces, so she was coming over for coffee to, to settle up with Ricky. So Ricky thought I might be interested in seeing Arlene because we hadn't seen her for some time. And um, so he invited us over for a cup of coffee. And he had uh, yellow umber here on there, all nicely framed, reframed. So I, I guess he must have picked up on the idea that Ian, Ian and Flora probably liked that one. And so he had it reframed, and we committed to it at that point. So that was the f came around the four times. So that had to be in our collection. It was destiny. Out of all of this, there are some lessons learned here. And the first is that um, if you see a piece at a gallery opening, or any piece of and this goes for more than just art. It could be antiques or whatever. If you like it, and if you and your spouse or partner can agree on it, commit to it. Do it. And if you're in doubt, um, put it on hold. Dealers are usually happy to do that. Place it on hold, and you have a second chance to give it some thought to see if you really it's a piece that you'd really like or not, or if it would fit in your collection. So those are the lessons that um, I think we can all draw from things that got away and um, come around again. Sometimes they don't come around again. Largely representational pieces, landscapes, traditional subjects, um, and that was that formed the the large bulk of our collection for about a period of seven to ten years. But a major shift took place in our tastes um, around 1980. Actually, Flora uh, had always had the stronger sense, the best sense, in terms of the stronger images. And I was more tentative. And so she brought me along in that sense, in terms of um, her taste, which was really nice. And, um, but it took, I guess it might have taken me a little bit longer to, to, to become familiar and attracted to, to abstracts. But the, the moment, the, the sort of um, time that it did was, was I recall 1980, and it was a show specifically of Ed Zelnax. Whether it was a retrospective of his or not, at Tielsen's or not, I'm not sure. But there was this one piece called Raw's Voyage to the Red X. It was on the invitation. They tend to be pretty appealing to us. They do catch your attention. And um, when we went to um, Ed's show at Tielsen's, this was one of the few that hadn't sold, and it was really curious. I was puzzled by that because it, it was quite a striking piece. But I was taking the longest time to assess it, to really understand what, what Zelnak was trying to get at, because there were references to Egyptian mythology and the notion of the, the pharaohs uh, being transported across the Nile to the 
the Valley of the Kings, and all of those reference caught up in Ra's voyage to the Red X, and in this wonderful glob of metal, molten metal that was on this gypsum board with these red dots on it, and uh, with a, a vessel circling the ancient Egyptian universe. So I was really drawn into that. And I must have been standing there for a long, the longest time. If your building is burning down, what piece would you like to, would you, would you take with you? Well, apart from family photographs and any family members, this would be it. It'd be Ra's voyage, Ra's journey to the Red X. Yes, I think um, as a collector, um, I, I do act as a sort of a curator, not a professional one obviously, but one that's picked it up along the way. And um, so there's the question of, of selection. I know, as I understand the definition of cur a curator, there you have to involved in selecting the works, um, organizing them, presenting them, and caring for them. And I think those are the, the basic elements of a job description. <clears throat> so I think pretty much we probably fit that description, more or less, to the best of our ability. So with respect, with respect to the selection aspects of the cu curatorial function, we've tried to um, follow regional artists for the, for the most part, and we've talked about that before, and especially artists we know. That's part of our collecting and selecting criteria. And um, we also try, and I think most curators, professional creators, curators I should say, in public galleries, try to fill gaps in their collection if they've followed artists over time and um, either through donation or purchase, they try to fill in those periods of the artist's career that, they, that, isn't, that aren't represented in the collection to try to flesh things out and make it more complete. So um, we try to do that as well. And um, probably a, a recent example of that is um, focusing on local or regional female artists. And in this case, we've We've purchased recently Rosemary Sloot, uh, Janine Madison, who's a good friend of ours, has been for a long time, Pat Gibson, and Sylvia Clark. Um, she's no longer with us, but um, I met her once, I think, when she was an administrator um, in continu met continuing medical education of the Faculty of Medicine, when I was in the Department of Finance at Western, and met her once or twice, perhaps, at a cocktail party or some sort of event, but it never did, we never did acquire her works. But this one particular piece, um, a nude study, came up at a silent auction we had at um, the Unity Project for, the, um, uh, for, for helping the homeless um, in London. And uh, so we had an opportunity to collect a Sylvia Clark, and uh, so, that's, so that's how we got that one. The other functions with respect to curatorial duties that we've, I've sort of inherited are organizing and presenting. And um, with our move from Warncliffe um, in 2006 to here, in fact, it, it, I found that, always found, wherever we've been, it's taken time to organize things on the walls, to get them in the right spots, to find the right home where they're happy, and they can talk to each other without too much um, arguing going on and fighting back and forth. So it's taken time, and um, I knew it was going to take some time my daughter Cynthia actually bet me um, that I wouldn't have these up in a year. And I, rather sadly, I lost that bet because it took six years before we finally got everything sorted out and organized in terms of the, the colors and shapes and the sizes and the materials and that sort of thing that, that we concern ourselves with. And um, actually it was, it was so bad that, and Flora was so, very, very patient here. She, she would never ever asked me, Ian, when are we going to get some more works up on the wall? She was so patient that way. But when uh, a therapist came in to assess her when she fell ill, we didn't know this particular, I think it was a physiotherapist or occupational therapist, I'm not sure now, but we didn't know her from Adam. She came in, stopped at the, um, the threshold of our apartment, just stopped dead in her tracks. The paintings were still leaning up against the wall. This is after six years many of them anyway. Some I had gotten up because there were soft walls, walls that were interior, so I could hammer hammer things in. The rest I couldn't on the load-bearing walls and the firewalls. Really tough stuff, right? I needed a drill. Ian didn't have one. He's an accountant, not a carpenter. So 
the physical therapist came in, stopped at the threshold, looked around, looked at me, didn't know her from any, anybody, said, moving in or moving out? Well, that did it. It was soon after that that I got 10 more pieces, 10 or so more pieces up on the wall and um, got some help from friends at the Macintosh. That's the kind of time I've taken in every lo move, in every location we've gone to, to try to get things organized on the wall that, where they have some meaning as a collection. And um, one, one good example of that might be the Kernow and Roberts. And um, in this case, we've got um, a Greg Kernow Doc Morton wheel, um, obviously a circular form, that universal circle that suggests unity and wholeness. And um, up above the Bill Roberts, William Roberts, I should say, night pairs. And that again is a repetition of the circle. And in this case, we've got different materials. We've got the, um, uh, the Kernow, um, that's a, a print of acrylics on plastic, double printed. And the Bill Roberts is um, a watercolor, but they were both resident artists at the Macintosh. So um, that was a, one of the, another reason for, for hanging them uh, together as colleagues and um, just different, different color combinations, attractive. And the other combination is the um, Rolly Fenwick and the Duncan de Kergamo. And again, two different um, materials. The de Kergamo is an oil on canvas, and the Fenwick is a watercolor. Both good friends, both former colleagues from the Department of Visual Arts and the studio department. And these are two references to um, the degradation of the environment. And actually, um, Rowley's uprooted column um, was done at the same time that the Twin Towers in New York were attacked by terrorists in, in 2001. And um, so it represents that, but it's also um, nature's way of, it's collapsing and it's um, made, made basically by nature itself. So in, in the case of um, Duncan de Kirkamo, the title is uh, Gravel Pit, and that's the degradation of nature by man. And um, so we've got those two images juxtaposed. And again, two, as I said before, two different materials, one a watercolor, one a, an oil on canvas. Um, I think I think it's probably a very much the same or different sides of the same coin. Um, I think for individuals, it, it, intuitively, it's maybe somewhat easier because there's not the need to consult with a partner or a friend, or I should say, partner or spouse, in terms of the selection of the work. So the individual, if they like it or not, can just simply commit to it, and that's it. Um, but there's also the disadvantage of not having a sounding board, a spouse or partner to bounce ideas off and to confirm your, your intuition or your, your thoughts about a particular work or not. So you don't have that opportunity of um, comparing notes and discussing, challenging each other, and so forth before you commit to an art, a piece of, a piece of art. So I think the individual, while it might seem on the surface to be an advantage that you're able to do it, make, it, make a decision quickly, it may not be the best decision in terms of having worked it through uh, with with a partner. Um, on the other hand, the partners or spouses have to get together from time to time, and they have to talk to each other, which can be sometimes a rare, rare occasion. But it's particularly important when we're talking about buying art on a budget, and not to walk walk away with more than one piece at the end of a show. I, we've always collected something as kids, hockey cards, baseball cards. I know Flora cl collected record albums, rock and roll particularly. She's very fond of Elvis Presley. So I think like any kids we collected various things. As adults we collected stamps and antique furniture and antiques. Um, Flora's mom was an antique dealer. She had an antique shop in the Ottawa Valley so that was made a pretty easy choice for collecting. But I think um, we've had other interests as well, and um, season's tickets to the Western Mustang football games, um, to the Grand Theater for plays, and for Orchestra London. But the one constant passion we've had over the past 40 years has been art, collecting art. We've come to realize that artists, and I think it's generally recognized that artists have a special gift, 
and that is that they're able to see the world and see things in the world that many of us or most of us can't or don't see. And not only that, they have this, this gift to recognize this and to see these things, but they also have the need to share their vision and view of the world with others. They have the energy to produce the work, put it out in the public, and the courage to face the, and most often, uh, indifference. And it's, it's this sort of thing, this, the strength and the courage that we've seen in artists over the years that um, lead Flora and I to, I think we've wanted to recognize and encourage and support their efforts by buying art and buying their works and, and um, supporting it just generally. And actually it's not so much about the art itself, it's about the relationships that we've developed with artists. And um, I think it's fairly safe to say that apart from family, that is children and grandchildren, that the love of our life has been the relationships and friendships we've had with artists who've come to know over the years.